right now. Right now on the night beat, two Bear County inmates die while in custody. Details on how and who BCSO believes is responsible for at least one of those deaths. Plus, an 11 year old is sent to the hospital after playing with a gun found in an apartment courtyard. We're hearing what neighbors have to say about the scary incident. But first, let's talk about the weather temperatures in and around San Antonio going to start off a little spring like at the beginning of the week, but they will drop later in the week here to tell us exactly how cold it's going to get meteorologist Katie Blake. Hi, Katie. Hey guys, hope you had a great weekend. It was so beautiful this weekend. So uh, in comparison to what we were treated to the past couple of days, what we have coming in just a few days is going to be quite a significant change, but the cold air is still several days off. In fact, we've got to get through a chance of rain early in the day Monday before we start to talk about temperatures falling, but we do have some really cold air in the forecast for this week. Today was a wonderful day. We started off just one degree above freezing at the airport and made it almost to 70 this afternoon. It felt great out there. Blue skies, low humidity tonight. Temperatures are starting to fall into the mid 40s up across parts of the hill country around San Antonio. We're generally in the mid to upper 50s and low 60s down to the south of Highway 90. So feeling nice and comfortable out there tonight. But overnight, while we're sleeping, rain is going to move in and we do have a chance of some showers and even a few thunderstorms, mainly first part of the day on Monday. Then Wednesday night, our next strong cold front arrives and that sets us up for a couple of bitterly cold days Thursday and Friday this week. So a lot going on with the weather over the next several days. I'll walk you through it all, let you know what to expect this week coming up in just a little bit, guys. We'll see you then, Katie. Thank you. New on the night beat, a 40 year old inmate at the Bear County Jail is dead tonight. This after the sheriff's office says he was assaulted by two other inmates this morning. Officials say the man who was killed was reportedly feeling uncomfortable in his cell when 50 year old Ernesto Tavera and 28 year old Brandon Lerma allegedly ran into an officer station repeatedly stabbing the man. Tavera and Lerma were both detained as deputies attempted to perform life saving measures on the man. The unnamed victim was taken to the hospital where he was pronounced dead. The victim was serving time for aggravated robbery and an out of county warrant for assault. Investigators say all three members are all three men rather are members of the Mexican Mafia prison gang. Also at the jail, 29 year old Vanessa Estrada died from COVID-19 complications. The sheriff's office says she was at University Hospital when she died around 1 p.m. BCSO says Estrada tested positive while in jail and was quarantined until her condition started to get worse. Deputies say the inmate also had tuberculosis and no indication that she had been vaccinated while in custody. And an 11 year old girl is in critical condition after being shot just northwest of downtown at an apartment complex. Police believe what happened this morning was an accident. The night team's John Paul Barajas explains the gun might have been stashed when kids stumbled across it. Screams of panic echoed throughout the Canlin West apartments off of West Avenue and Bassey Road around 10 this morning. According to SAPD, an 11 year old girl was shot after she and an eight year old boy found a handgun. Here there's gunshot wound or gunshot going off and I guess one of the kids, you know, got hurt because all I, you could hear was like, you, sh you know, she's bleeding, you know, help. Police believe the two kids found the gun stashed somewhere near the laundry room and then began playing with it out here in the courtyard. That's when the 11 year old girl was accidentally shot in the upper shoulder area and then rushed to the hospital. Marisol Vega and George Valdez explained kids are always running around and playing in the complex and can't believe something like this happened. People shouldn't be stashing guns around like that. Just the fact that, you know, that could have been your kid. And I told him this is the reason why, you know, when you want to go outside, you got to let mom and dad know. If you want to go to the car to get something, you need to let mom and dad know. Vega has two young kids of her own and has already sat them down to talk about gun safety as well. But she also has a message for whoever hid the gun in the first place. It was in a public place, you know, where you try to hide it so that you didn't get in trouble for something that you were doing. Everything you do has a consequences and unfortunately those consequences are for somebody that is innocent. And at last check, that 11 year old girl is still in the hospital in critical condition. Police tell us the two kids are not related and at this time they don't know who was handling the gun when it went off. We're also still waiting to find out if police can track that gun to any former crimes or a person. 
at Public Safety Headquarters. John Paul Barajas, KSAT 12 News. Other stories we're following tonight. San Antonio police are looking for the man who robbed the stop and shop on Bassey Road. Police say it all started with the suspect grabbing two beers from the back of the store around 8 o'clock last night. The victim telling police when the suspect came to the counter, he reached for a gun, fired off one round into the floor, then demanded money from the register. The cashier complied and the suspect took off running towards San Pedro. Police have not yet found that suspect. In your latest news, a driver is behind bars after hitting and killing someone overnight. All this happening around 2 a.m. on Northwest Loop 410 near Fredericksburg Road. Police say a person was crossing the road when the driver of a Dodge Charger hit them. The driver stopping and waiting for police to arrive. However, officers say the driver showed signs of intoxication and was arrested for DWI. The victim's name remains unknown at this time. Meanwhile, three women are in critical condition tonight after a major crash over on the city's north side. Take a look. This was the scene around 2 o'clock this morning on I-10 West in Fresno. Officers say the damaged vehicle was traveling south on the highway when the 28-year-old driver lost control. Also in that car, two passengers in their 40s. They were all taken to a nearby hospital to be treated. Police tell us that driver now facing charges of intoxication assault. A 41-year-old West Texas Sheriff's deputy has died after a crash this afternoon. DPS officials say Loving County Deputy Lauren Breedman was driving to help another deputy with a call around 4.30 p.m. when she collided with a semi-tractor trailer truck. She was pronounced dead at the scene. Meanwhile, the truck driver was not injured and has not been charged with a crime. And Roland Caballero, the man accused of shooting three Houston police officers, is now facing additional federal charges. The 31-year-old allegedly used a machine gun to wound the officers during a car chase on Thursday. Caballero now faces federal weapon charges, plus three counts of attempted capital murder of a police officer. During a search of the felon's home, investigators found assault weapons, shotguns, and five handguns, all illegal for him to own. Caballero is also charged with aggravated robbery for a carjacking related to the chase. The three officers had non-life-threatening injuries. And looking ahead to this week, uh, we are getting ready to bring you a Defenders special hour-long investigation this week. It's called A Necessary Evil. It's about working with confidential informants, known criminals, already in trouble with the law, who help police, deputies, and prosecutors with felony cases. Law enforcement officials say they've been helpful in fighting local crime, but there are some flaws in the practice, including instances where innocent people have gone to prison or have lost their lives. The special airs this Tuesday, February 1st, right here on KSAT 12 and KSAT.com. While the number of deaths in the U.S. are inching closer to 900,000, there are some hopeful signs in the numbers, specifically that the country could be through the worst of the Omicron wave. 41 states and Washington, D.C. reporting a plunge case numbers. In 2020, before the World Health Organization declared a pandemic, a BioNTech CEO and his wife collaborated with Pfizer to develop a shot. The decision was directly after reading that paper and understanding that we were probably already in the midst of a pandemic. We have to pivot the company and we have to start to develop a vaccine based on, on our technology. The CEO of Pfizer told them, yes, they had a vaccine. It's a 95% effective, which is an efficacy rate not easy to achieve. That was a huge relief for the couple. More than 62 million eligible Americans still remain unvaccinated. Back here at home, Metro Health says COVID hospitalizations are slowly decreasing. In their last report, there were 1,245 patients in the hospital, 282 in the ICU, with 127 people on ventilators. Metro Health also confirming 15 more people have died from COVID. Community Labs is opening a new COVID-19 public testing site this week, and you can expect quicker turnaround times for results. It's going to be at Divine Providence Catholic Church, located at 5667 Old Pearsall Road. It's open Monday through Friday from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. Officials with Community Labs say people will get their results in just under 48 hours. Appointments are no longer required. That's not the only testing site, though. There are many others that you can go to, and we have a list of them for you all right now on KSAT.com. To make things easy, just pull out your phone and scan this QR code with the camera app, 
and a link will pop up and take you directly to that list. Tomorrow is the final day to register to vote for the March primary election. If you aren't sure whether you're registered or not, we can help you find out on KSAT.com. We have a link where you can check your status. Also on our website, you can find everything you need to know about the primary election, including a look at what's on the ballot. Early voting begins on February 14th and election day is March 1st. Also happening tomorrow, it's the last day to pay your 2021 property tax bill to avoid penalty or interest. The Bear County Tax Assessor's Office will have extended business hours tomorrow at all of its locations, including curbside drop-offs and a drive through option. Payments can also be made online at bear.org slash tax or by phone by calling the number on your screen. If you're a taxpayer on a payment plan, this deadline does not apply to you. And listen to this. If you have accounts with an active lawsuit from a prior year, they will be assessed an additional 15% fee on the 2021 taxes if they are not paid by Monday. For more information on all of this, call the tax office at 210-335-2251. Still ahead on the night beat, cancer. It can be scary to hear that you have it, but the fact is more people are surviving thanks to the treatments available, but the side effects of some of them can be long lasting. The impact of chemo break. Plus, when chilly weather hits, many people turn to space heaters to stay cozy and warm, but it's important to take safety precautions when using them. We're seeing how quick your home can go up in flames if you're not careful. The start of the week will have a much different feel than the end of the week. Yeah, it was a beautiful weekend, but things are changing, Katie. Yeah, unfortunately, it's not going to stay so nice and tranquil this week. We've got a couple big changes coming. Uh, the biggest one will be the cold front Wednesday night into Thursday. Uh, look at how your temperatures change second half of the week. My friends, we go from an afternoon high around 70 on Wednesday to temperatures potentially stuck in the 30s all day Thursday and then another bitterly cold day on Friday. We do have a window for a little bit of light wintry mix across a portion of the area. We'll talk about that, but before we get to that front, we've got a chance of rain to talk about on Monday, and this is good because uh, if you've been with us for the past couple of weeks, we've been talking about how the drought situation has been getting worse and worse, so any rain is a welcome sight, that's for sure. Temperatures currently 58 in Hondo, 48 up in Kerrville, and we've still got a few folks in the low 60s at 62 in Del Rio, also 62 in Catula. Mostly clear skies. We're going to see cloud cover increase after midnight through early tomorrow morning. That comes hand in hand with the increasing rain chances as well. You can see some rain there off to the west of San Angelo up across the panhandle as well. That's thanks to an upper level low that's spinning counterclockwise over New Mexico. This is centered just off to the west of Lubbock. This is a nice piece of rain making energy that will drop to the southeast tomorrow and just move right overhead. This will bring us our chances of rain to start the week on Monday. And if you kind of have some deja vu here, maybe this is a similar setup to what we we're looking at this time last weekend. We had some rain chances heading into early on Monday. The difference here is that this disturbance that will be moving overhead tomorrow is a bit stronger. It has a bit more energy with it, extra lift, and that will help to actually produce some more rain. So higher rainfall coverage and also some areas of heavier rain as we get into the first part of the day tomorrow. So let me walk you through future casts through 3, 3 a.m cloud cover increases and we will start to see some rain develop in the pre dawn hours of Monday by 6 a.m. We've got a higher coverage of rain around. We're looking at some showers and also some non severe storms through the first part of the day tomorrow. These are just going to be uh, some rumbles of thunder, some pockets of heavy rain that will continue all the way through the morning commute and then through about lunchtime. As we get past lunchtime tomorrow, rain is really going to begin to be focused east of the I 35 corridor along and east of I-35. And as we get into late morning, early afternoon, that's where again, east of I-35, east of 281, we could have one or two more noisy storms that may produce some small hail. But overall tomorrow, we're not worried about severe weather. Now, as we get into late tomorrow afternoon, early tomorrow evening, this complex of storms will get a bit more oomph to it, but that'll be as it's moving out of our area and off toward the Houston area. So Evening commute will be an issue way off to our east. Commute that will be affected for us tomorrow will just be the morning drive. By the afternoon, rain chances will fall out of the forecast. 
and then by this time tonight, uh, rain will be completely out of the area. So here's a look at potential rainfall totals over the next 24 hours. Thanks to this rain chance on Monday. Highest totals will be well off to the east. So places like Gonzales, Cuero, Hallettsville, you guys had the best chance to see one to two inches of rain and maybe even a bit more than that. As you work back to the west, rain potential, uh, rainfall potential does fall off. Uh, nonetheless, uh, as we get into Wilson County, even up into New Braunfels, Guadalupe County, uh, even a portion of uh, Kendall County here, one to two inches of rain will be possible. And then anywhere from Bandera, Kerr County, even into Western Bear County um, and parts of Medina County, it's likely going to be less than a half inch of rain and then even lower totals off to the west of I-35. So best chance for the most rain will be off to the east tomorrow. So here's a look at your day. Rain chances highest in the morning. You'll notice as we get to lunchtime here, that's when they start to fall off just a bit. An isolated chance through about 3 p.m. And then after that, we'll start to even see a little bit of clearing later in the day tomorrow. Look for a high temperature in the mid 60s. Uh, pretty warm day Tuesday, even into Wednesday. But during the day on Wednesday, cold front will be barreling through Texas. We'll have the chance to jump into the low 70s Wednesday afternoon. But by Thursday morning, our temperatures just tank potentially down into the 30s. This is going to be a frigid air mass moving into Texas with such a cold air mass, a little bit of moisture there is the potential for some wintry precipitation uh, across parts of Texas, mainly central and north Texas. That's where I think things will be uh, potentially a bit more problematic with some accumulating ice issues in central Texas and then off north closer uh, closer to the I-20 corridor. For us right now, things uh, look like a light wintry mix with maybe a little bit of freezing rain and sleet north of Highway 90, but there are still some questions that we need to answer there. For now, it looks like impacts due to precipitation will be minimal, but that is one thing that we're going to continue to watch over the next couple of days as well as the potential for portions of our area, mainly north of Highway 90, to be below freezing for about 24 hours. That's not going to be the whole area, but there is the potential for part of the area uh, to be below freezing for a good chunk of time here later on in the week. So those are the things we're monitoring closely. What you need to go ahead and plan for are some really frigid days Thursday and Friday. We're talking wind chills down in the teens uh, those days, and also a hard freeze is likely Thursday night and Friday night. We feel uh, high High confidence there and just very frigid days Thursday into Friday. So go ahead and just keep that in the back of your mind. We'll keep you updated on the precipitation potential. It's possible that we get a lot of dry air that moves in behind this front and that would really shrink the window for any precipitation at all. So still some things we're watching here. Of course, we'll keep you updated. Make sure you have that KSAT Weather Authority app handy and ready to go because we'll be keeping you updated as uh, the week goes on, guys. Let's see if we can fit all of the seasons into the right? next seven days. Yeah. <laughs> Don't Katie put away your toes. sweaters, your coats just yet. Keep them all out there. Yep. All right, Greg will be along with a preview of Instant Replay when we get back. Well, we're all set now. The Los Angeles Rams are headed to Super Bowl 56 in Los Angeles after they were able to knock off the San Francisco 49ers to win the NFC Championship. With more of what's on Instant Replay tonight, let's check in with our Greg Simmons. Hasn't this been the best NFL playoffs oh, ever? Been good. I hope the Super Bowl lives up to you, you know what I mean? Yes. And they will be joined by the Cincinnati Bengals who stunned the Chiefs in Kansas City in overtime to win the AFC Championship. Coming up tonight on a brand new edition of Instant Replay. They're down and one. The Los Angeles Rams face the San Francisco 49ers tonight to get to decide who gets to go to Super Bowl 56 in Los Angeles in two weeks, and it will be the Rams, but it would take a last-second field goal and a turnover to seal it for Los Angeles, who gets to play at home for the title game. We'll show you how they did it. He's got protection. Too much time. You can't do that. All the way back to the 21. For the second straight week, the Kansas City Chiefs had to go to overtime to decide who gets to play in Super Bowl 56 from the AFC. Patrick Mahomes had a chance to win it in regulation, but gets sacked, forcing the Chiefs to settle for a field goal to in regulation. But his biggest mistake came in overtime to lead to the stunning upset for Cincinnati. We will show you. Either one of us likes to back down. And, um, you know, it, it's hard seeing this fight go, you know. Um, it's hard picturing it going, you know, the full 12 rounds. 
And San Antonio's own Mario Barrios gets ready to make his welterweight debut when he returns to the ring in Las Vegas this coming weekend. What advantage does Mario have over his opponent? Our Larry Ramirez will get you ready for fight night. All that plus, the Spurs are in action tonight. And who wins Super Bowl 56 tonight? You decide. Instant Replay is live, and it's after the night beat. I'll give you a little hint. The Rams are the early three and a half point favorites. A right, lot to talk about tonight. Yes. We'll give you an extra minute to get <laughs> Thank on you. It. I'll take it. <laughs> if you didn't make a New Year's resolution, there's still a day left in January 12 on your sides. Marilyn Moritz tells us some tips on cleaning out our closets and what we can do with the extra clothes. Plus, millions of Americans were left shoveling their way out of the latest winter storm up in the Northeast. Coming up, who was affected and just how much snow they were left with. We'll be right back. Welcome back. As we begin this second half hour, I wanted to let you know before we continue, we want to apologize if you were waiting to see that story about a Bernie man who battled COVID for several months. We are having some technical difficulties and we're not able to show you that tonight. We'll be sure to update you as soon as we can. Meanwhile, around America tonight, nine people are dead and several others injured after a six vehicle crash in the Las Vegas area. The Las Vegas police say yesterday afternoon, a Driver sped through a red light and crashed into several vehicles at the intersection. Police say 18 people involved in that crash, including minors. The speeding driver was among those killed in the crash. President Biden is carefully making his decision on who he will nominate to replace retiring Supreme Court Justice Stephen Breyer. He made a campaign promise to nominate a black woman to the nation's highest court, which he said is long overdue. In a recent ABC News poll, three out of four Americans think the president should consider all possible nominees rather than only black women. The chair of the Senate Judiciary Committee saying he hopes Biden's nominee will garner bipartisan support. Mixed messages from Russia after it returned some of its troops to their bases, but it's still sending military equipment to a border with Ukraine. The U.S. ambassador to the United Nations calling for a meeting of the Security Council Tomorrow, Russia says it is returning some of its troops back to their bases after a planned combat readiness check. This comes while thousands still line Ukraine's border. Russian troops have been positioned north of Ukraine for nearly two weeks now. The Pentagon says Russia could attack Ukraine with very little warning. This is larger in scale and scope uh, in the massing of forces than anything we have seen um, uh, in recent memory. However, Ukraine's president has been very critical of the United States for overstating the crisis, a U.S. official saying he is, quote, downplaying the risk of invasion. The Northeast is digging out a powerful winter storm that affected most of the coast. Thousands are still without power and harsh cold temperatures. In Boston, there was nearly two feet of snow. It was a ferocious winter storm with curtains of snow falling all day long, visibility at times near zero, and the brutal wind chills well below zero degrees. In Massachusetts, some areas were buried under as much as 30 inches of snow. This was officially designated a blizzard by the National Weather Service, and we reached a total of 23.8 inches of snow. That is the second biggest January storm in Boston history. The snow and ice is making for dangerous travel, too. Tractor trailers have overturned New York City and airports in Philadelphia, New York, and Boston, seeing thousands of flight cancellations. And when temps start to drop, many people bring out their space heaters to stay nice and warm. But if you're not careful, it could lead to a disaster. Yeah, folks might be uh, pulling them out later this week. ABC's Rob Marciano shows us how quick your home can catch on fire without the proper precautions. As winter temperatures continue to drop, some homeowners will fight the cold with space heaters. And experts warn that stationary and portable space heaters cause 81% of home heating fire deaths. Just this month in New York City, this 19-story Bronx apartment building engulfed in flames killing 17 people, including a two-year-old. Officials say a space heater sparked the fire, devastating the community. In the last few weeks, space heaters contributed to fires nationwide. This one in Illinois igniting a second-story bedroom, and this one in Texas leaving one person dead. The heaters, please be careful with these heaters. Last winter, GMA teamed up with Montgomery County Fire and Rescue Service to demonstrate the potential dangers of space heaters and how to stay safe. First, how hot can they really get? And then you see it spiking to 300 degrees. If you were to touch that, you could burn yourself. The next demonstration, how quickly a fire can spread when a space heater is too close to combustible items. 
This mock living room has a space heater placed too close to the couch. And the safety feature, an automatic shutdown if the space heater overheats, has been turned off. You can see smoke already. Look at it coming up from underneath the couch now. Right, we're going to step away. The flames begin to build. Firefighters having to put the blaze out after just five minutes. You could not survive this. Authorities say fires happen when people use the space heaters unsafely, not because the device is unsafe. How do you stay safe? Well, keep space heaters at least three feet away from anything that can burn. Never use an extension cord. Plug the space heater directly into the wall outlet and never leave a space heater unattended. Those are some great tips, especially because we, during the winter, we don't have to use space heaters a lot. Every now and then, maybe, uh, but not too often. And something to keep in mind, those tips there for later this week when we see another push of really cold air move in. That will be on Thursday, and we'll talk more about that coming up in just a bit. Before we get to the cold air this week, we've got a chance of rain moving in overnight through tomorrow morning. There's already some rain building off to our west, and that will start to fill in overnight. We'll take another look at your Monday future cast and another look at the strong cold front coming later this week in your full forecast along in just a bit. Tim. Thank you, Katie. Making health headlines, almost 40% of us will be told at some point we have cancer. The fact is that more and more people are surviving, but the side effects of treating cancer, especially chemotherapy, can be long lasting. Ursula Perry tells us how the impact of chemo brain could last for the rest of their lives. Tessa Gauzy was young, vibrant, and healthy. And one day, just after a run, I was like, my breast hurts. And it hadn't done that before, and I was like, okay. So when I was taking my shower after, I felt the lump. She was diagnosed with invasive ductal carcinoma. Tessa underwent a double mastectomy and chemotherapy. And although both of their side effects, it was the chemo that threw her for a loop. Most patients diagnosed with cancer will experience some degree of cognitive decline throughout their cancer experience. Chemo brain usually improves within 9 to 12 months, but up to 20 percent of people may have long-term effects, including problems with memory, word retrieval, concentration, following instructions, multitasking, and setting priorities. A study from Washington University in St. Louis found that once you're diagnosed, rest may not be the best medicine. Patients may benefit more from moving their bodies and being physically active in the days and weeks leading up to treatment rather than just sitting and resting. Another study out of Dana-Farber suggests that aerobic exercises like walking, running, dancing, or cycling have the most impact. Tessa found her focus by spinning. It's kind of been a lifesaver. Much like the issues having to do with COVID brain fog, doctors aren't exactly sure what is causing chemo brain. They surmise that it might have to do with the anxiety involved in getting a cancer diagnosis, but also the use of cancer drugs like tamoxifen, as opposed to those who just get chemotherapy. Ursula Perry, KSAT 12 News. He is recalling more than 410,000 cars in the U.S. because of possible airbag issues. The recall includes a number of Forte, Sedona, and Seoul models. The National Highway Traffic Safety Administration says airbag computer covers could possibly damage the electrical circuit. That could result in the airbags not being activated in a crash. Owners can contact Kia's customer service line for more information. Still ahead on the night beat, to keep or not to keep. Up next, we have some tips to help you sell, donate, or even recycle your old clothes. Well, like Eminem, we're cleaning out the closet. Well, at least talking about it anyways. Maybe this is the year you finally do it, parting with clothing that just doesn't work for you anymore. 12 on your sides, Marilyn Moritz has information to help you sell, donate, or even recycle. Anya Stapleton is cleaning out the closets. I am making a pile of some sweaters that I haven't worn in a very long time. More than 9 million tons of clothing ends up in landfills every year, according to the EPA. Bad for the planet and lost opportunities to make some cash. I'm hoping to get rid of some of these online and sell them for 
pretty much as close to the original value I can. There's a growing number of digital stores and phone apps tailored to sell anything you want to get rid of. On sites like Poshmark and Vinted, you list your item and name your price. You ship it directly to the buyer with a prepaid shipping label. With ThreadUp and RealReal, you send your unwanted items off to be sorted, priced, and listed for sale. Whether they're online or in person, vintage and consignment shops won't take everything. Often it's because of the condition of the item or it's out of style. So if you can't sell it, but it's still usable, donate. Goodwill is just one example. It collects and sells donations to support job placement programs. There are a lot of local nonprofits that would happily take your gently used clothing. Have professional clothes that you just don't need anymore? Try Dress for Success. Anya found a taker for her old formals. Our local high schools will often say, we want dresses that maybe for uh, students who can't afford a prom dress. You can also share or trade with neighbors by using Free Cycle Network or Buy Nothing Facebook groups. Finally, you can always recycle. Check out earth911.com to find a textile recycling location. Marilyn Moritz, KSAT 12 News. Winter is not done with us. No. That's the message tonight. Yeah. Um, I posted this on social media earlier uh, when I was sharing the forecast. I said, do your future self a favor and just check in with the forecast this week because we've got a lot going on and we'll continue to make some minor twink, uh, twinks. <laughs> That's not a word. Tweaks. Okay, here we go. Minor tweaks. <laughs> but the biggest story is the cold air coming in for the second half of the week. Now, normally I would put the little cold front icon on here, but I thought, nah, it's pretty obvious when the cold front comes through. We'll go from an afternoon high in the low 70s Wednesday to, yes, afternoon temperatures potentially stuck in the 30s for two days this week, Thursday and Friday. So let's take another look at this setup. Strong cold front will be barreling into Texas on Wednesday. Again, we'll have time Wednesday afternoon to still be fairly warm, but by Wednesday night, this will drop south and potentially bring in air as cold as the 30s by Thursday morning. So very cold air moving in here and some moisture to work with as this front comes through. Now, there's still a lot of questions uh, to be answered as far as precipitation type, not just here at home, but also elsewhere across the state. It does look like frozen precipitation, ice, even some snow that would cause issues is more likely across the northern tier of the state. That's where it will be colder. And they're looking at the potential for maybe some more icing across central and even north Texas. For us here at home, right now it appears that north of Highway 90, there could be a light wintry mix as we get into early Thursday. That would be a really cold rain, potentially changing over to freezing rain with a little bit of sleet mixed in. Now I'm gonna step off really quickly so you can take a look at this. Sarah Spivey put this graphic together and I think it's just a great example um, or a great way to compare what we're looking at this week with this cold weather moving in as compared to what we were dealing with last February. This will be nothing like what we were dealing with last February, not even close as Sarah put on the graphic here. So time below freezing last year, four and a half days. Potentially this week, some spots could spend 18 to 36 hours below freezing. Precipitation with last year's storm, a lot of ice and a lot of snow um, that made travel difficult and at times impossible. As I just mentioned, this week we're looking at the potential for a light wintry mix north of Highway 90 for some of us early on Thursday that really shouldn't be a big deal at all. Cold temperatures, the cold air itself, last year we got as cold as 9 with a wind chill 8 below zero. This week we're looking at air temperatures as low as the 20s and our wind chills in the teens. Now that's cold, but what we're looking at this week is not going to be anything like what we were dealing with last year. And I know for some folks when they see um, such cold air in the forecast, that's our thought because it was just such a stressful time last year. But we just want you to know it will be cold later on this week, but we're not looking at the impacts um, to infrastructure or anything like that. 
like what we were dealing with last February. So just want to kind of put your mind at ease there. Mostly clear for now, just shy of 60. It feels really great out there. It's been such a great weekend. We're at 53 in Kerrville, 58 in Beeville, and 62 in Catula. We'll drop down into the low to mid 50s tomorrow morning with rain chances kicking in. So we've got a disturbance moving in from the west that will bring us a chance of some showers and non severe storms, mainly through the first part of the day tomorrow with rain chances tapering off in the afternoon, certainly by the evening. Radar here at home is quiet, but we are starting to see some precipitation fill in from Lubbock down to just west of San Angelo, and that's because we've got a nice rainmaker here that will drop down and move across our area during the day tomorrow. So while we're sleeping tonight, clouds fill in. Some rain starts to fill in into the pre-dawn hours of Monday morning. By the Monday morning commute, we've got areas of rain around. So the commute that will be affected on Monday will be the morning commute. By the evening, things will have started to clear out. But we're looking at showers and non-severe storms through the morning drive, essentially through late morning, closer to lunchtime. After lunchtime, rain will really start to move east off closer to the Houston Houston area and then by mid to late afternoon we're looking good here and we should even get to clear out just a little bit as we head into Monday evening. Again, not concerned about severe weather tomorrow, but there could be some rumbles of thunder. And as we get into late morning, early afternoon, especially east of 35, there could be a couple noisy storms with some small hail. Overall, this is just an opportunity to pick up a little bit of much needed rain. Unfortunately, where we need the rain the most west of I-35, that's where our lowest rainfall totals are likely to be tomorrow. So this won't be a drought busting rain for us on Monday, but at least it's a little something and we'll continue to keep you updated on the cold air poised to move in later this week. Guys, to make sure my warm pants are ready for later in the week. Yes. <laughs> Put away the shorts. Thanks, Katie. Uh huh. All right, with a huge storm keeping much of the U.S. at home this weekend and no new movies in the theaters, it was a slow weekend at the box office after the break. The top films that did draw some people to the theaters. $1.8 million kept The King's Man in fifth place. Redeeming Love managed to stay in fourth, earning $1.9 million. Sing 2 is up to $135 million domestic after a third place weekend worth $4.8 million. Scream settled for second place, scaring up $7.4 million. They're a danger to our universe. Nothing can stop Spider-Man No Way Home. The blockbuster made another $11 million for a domestic total of $736 million, closing in on Avatar for third place on the all-time chart. In Hollywood, I'm David Daniel. Spidey's still slinging webs from the top. <laughs> Our San Antonio Spurs on the road in Phoenix tonight before their final homestand before the rodeo road trip. And that final homestand will tip off on Tuesday when the Spurs host the Golden State Warriors with Clay Thompson finally back. With more on what's on instant replay tonight, let's head over to Greg Simmons. Hey, you know what that means. It means they're getting better, <laughs> which <laughs> is not good. Back. That's no. not good. And a pair of big wins for both the Clark Cougar boys and girls basketball teams this coming week. Coming up tonight on a brand new edition of instant replay. McDermott in trouble with a double team. Shot clock winding down and the buzzer beater. Our San Antonio Spurs in the Valley of the Sun to see if they can scare up a win against Phoenix. Their second meeting in just over two weeks will get you ready for the Spurs' final homestand that will include three games and four nights for their annual rodeo road trip. It's all part of our segment, Know Your Foe. <laughs> There you go, two of the hottest teams in high school basketball are the Clark Cougars boys and girls teams with big wins this past week. The girls team stays undefeated in district with a huge win over Reagan, and the boys team hands the Rattlers their first loss of the season in district. And the Edison Golden Bears just made their district race a little more interesting, and we'll show you the high school basketball games available on the BGC app and online, thanks to Texas Sports Productions. And we now know who's headed to Super Bowl 56. Instant replay is live, and it is next. Yeah, it's the wrong team from Ohio. I sorry. Yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> That's Northern Kentucky. Thank you, Greg. And coming up, a little boy gets a big surprise. Why one mailman decided to go above and beyond for the kid's birthday.